So our goals today are really to define what palliative care is. My hope is that you'll have a clearer understanding and a sense of comfort with understanding what is palliative care and hopefully be able to share that new knowledge and information with other people in your life. We'll be talking about what the focus of palliative care is, as well as defining the relationship between palliative care and hospice. And that's an area where often we find there's a lot of confusion and questions. And my hope is that we'll be able to have a better understanding about how these two um, services exist really in a continuum of care. So we can think about um, when they're appropriate to engage with and how they can help us, um, no matter what stage of life, what stage of a serious illness we may be faced with. So to start off with, let's consider this first question. What is palliative care? Well, the Center to Advance Palliative Care defines palliative care as specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness. It's focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of that illness. And the goal of palliative care is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. It's provided by a specially trained team of doctors, nurses, and other specialists. And in different settings, this may include social workers. It may include folks with, from spiritual care, um, different sorts of therapy like music therapy, um, again, depending on the setting, who work together with the patient's other doctors, their primary physician or other specialists they may be seeing for assistance with their illness, whether that's a heart disease or lung disease, a neurologic problem or cancer. And that team really provides an extra layer of support. So when we think about who qualifies for palliative care, it's really based on the needs of the patient, not on a specific prognosis. Prognosis here meaning someone's life expectancy related to the illness that they're facing. So there's often this misconception that palliative care is just for people for whom time may be growing short, but it's really about what are their needs. And that's really driven by their illness and how that's showing up in their body and in their life, how it may be affecting their quality of life, their ability to do the things that make their life rich and meaningful. It's appropriate at any age and at any stage of a serious illness. So it's not just reserved for people with advanced age um, or just for people who may be further down the line with their illness. It can also be provided along with curative treatment. So people do not have to reach the point where they want their care to focus entirely on comfort-oriented care to benefit from palliative care. It can be provided alongside curative and life-prolonging treatments. Um, today, we're gonna take a look at this model. I really like this. I think it exemplifies um, a couple really important ideas for us. I wanna just get oriented to what we're looking at here. So what we're really um, focusing on with this figure is kind of what the trajectory of illness looks like from the time of diagnosis of a serious illness, as time goes forward, whether that may be over months or years with that illness, um, toward the last chapter of life, death, and even that period of bereavement. So the timeline we're considering is, again, from that point of diagnosis of a serious illness on even past the point of death, understanding that the needs that someone has as they're faced with a serious illness include their own needs as that illness progresses, but also their needs as they approach death and the needs of their family, their loved ones who they may leave behind afterward. As we look at this figure, we can see that it's kind of partitioned in this first block between the white and purple, where over time as an illness progresses, more and more of the care that's received may be considered as palliative. That is, the focus of those treatments is not necessarily curative treatment or to prolong life, but really to focus on the alleviation of suffering, to address whatever kind of symptoms may come along as part of that illness, whereas over time, our options or available treatments to prolong life or restore life may diminish as our body is no longer able to respond to those treatments or options to try to extend and prolong our life or restore us to our prior quality of life may lessen. We then see that there's this block marked hospice, which kind of takes up a smaller stretch of time leading into death. And we're gonna talk more about the relationship between palliative care and hospice, what that timing looks like and what that transition can look like, as well as understanding, again, that there are needs for each of our patient's loved ones, even after their point of death. And so consideration for how we support people in that period of time is really important in understanding what supports in the medical system exist to offer that kind of support and care in that period of time. 
So here I wanna shift our attention to talk more about what is hospice? And this is often uh, a really big question where again, we find there's often misconceptions or misunderstandings about the nature of hospice and what it is. And so I wanna really just shine a light and focus on understanding that this is part of the continuum of care that was designed with a specific goal set in mind and a specific population of folks. We'll talk more about how it fits into this continuum of care as people go forward in time with a serious illness. So hospice really is a system that was designed to deliver health care to the patient who has a life expectancy of six months or less and has decided that they want their care to focus on comfort and quality of life. Now I have an asterisk here um, with this question of prognosis, the six month life expectancy, and this is a really important asterisk. Very often folks have the idea that hospice is really just for people who are at the very, very end of life. And in fact, most people who enroll in hospice do so at the very end of life, often when they have a week of life or less. So the first thing we can notice is that hospice is actually designed to support people for a much longer period of time than most people get that support, which in my opinion is a tragedy. As we'll see, this is a tremendous service that can do a lot to support people's quality of life, even in that last chapter of life. But the other thing that we have to say is that we're not great at predicting someone's life expectancy. There have been a lot of studies on this question. What we find is that physicians, for all of our knowledge and all of our experience, are not particularly great at predicting this with accuracy. The way that the hospice benefit was defined does not require that we're perfectly accurate. People can be enrolled on hospice under the understanding that given our best understanding of their illness and how things may progress over time, that they're likely to have six months of life or less. However, if they reach that six month timeline enrolled on hospice, they're not automatically ejected from hospice if they're still doing well and going on living. We simply have to repeat that assessment. And if the assessment remains the same, that yes, we expect that death is likely within the next six months, then folks can be qualified to remain on hospice services. So again, that life expectancy is not such a hard and fast rule as it may seem. It's certainly also not something that's prescribed. The idea of hospice is certainly not to hasten death or shorten life. The focus is on promoting the highest quality of life for the period of time that's defined under the hospice benefit. Again, that other factor is really when folks have reached the point that they want their care to focus on their comfort and quality of life. What we find is as folks go forward in time with a serious illness, that as the burdens of treatment um, that are necessary to extend or prolong their life or to try to restore them are increasing and the benefits of those treatments, that is their ability to be restored to a functional status or a quality of life they're accustomed to diminish, that at some point that goal does begin to shift away from doing whatever it takes to extend and prolong life instead to focus on comfort and quality. Where that point is for each individual is just that, an individual question, because it hinges on questions about how we define quality of life, how we define burden, and how we define benefit. Those are all unique and individual questions. They're not questions that can be answered by any physician or other medical professional because they really get to these specific questions of the individual. And yet, knowing where that point occurs is crucial for the medical team so that we can ensure that the care we're delivering is consistent with our patient's goals. And so when folks reach this point where time may be growing short, according to this asterisk um, of prognosis, and the goal has shifted to focus on comfort, that's really what hospice was designed for. Where can hospice care be delivered? Well, the location depends on a patient's needs at a given point in time. Hospice care can take place in patients' homes, in long-term care settings, as well as in specialized facilities called hospice houses. For someone to receive hospice services in their home, they have to still be independent or have adequate support for their 24-hour care needs. Hospice doesn't move in and set up around the clock care, so it really requires that someone's still pretty functional or has enough support to meet those hour-by-hour -hour care needs safely. In the case that someone is not able to meet their hour-by-hour -hour care needs on their own, then they're likely to be receiving care in a long-term care setting like a nursing home, where then hospice services can come as an extra layer of support around them. The hospice house we can think about as being the hospice's answer to the hospital. That is, 
It's the highest level of care where there's round the clock nursing support and daily visits from medical providers to assess uncontrolled symptoms. So folks that are receiving hospice services at home or in the nursing home, if they run into a symptom crisis that cannot be controlled in that setting, that's really what the hospice house is for, where they're able to do kind of the most advanced symptom management like IV medications and other treatments to try to get those symptoms back under control. If they are able to control those symptoms in a way that can be carried out back where that person came from, they'll often be returned to that setting. If they are reached the very end of life and are having significant symptoms during their active dying process, they may remain in the hospice house to continue to have that excellent high quality symptom support through that final chapter of life. The hospice team, like the palliative care team, is interdisciplinary in nature. It's made up of nurses working with social workers, spiritual care providers and physicians, again, as well as other um, healthcare providers and supports depending on the specific hospice agency. And the idea is really that they bring the care to the patient. So the whole team is available to the person who's on hospice. But the primary contact is the hospice nurse, who's a specially trained nurse with special skills for assessing and managing symptoms um, who's usually visiting two to three times per week, but is also available 24 seven for crisis management. So the idea being that with frequent visits, they can stay ahead of a crisis, but that if one does come up in the middle of the night on the weekend at any time, someone's available who's familiar with the plan to help give guidance over the phone and will come and make a face-to-face -face assessment to try to get symptoms under control. The goal is to try to avoid hospitalizations as typically at this point, folks are no longer desiring to go to the hospital. It takes a lot out of them without giving a lot back. Other considerations for hospice is that for folks who are in hospice at home, the hospice provides for any needed equipment. So if they need hospital beds, bedside commodes, oxygen, or anything else, that's all provided under the hospice benefit. Any medications are provided, so we no longer are having to go to a variety of providers for our medications. And all of those services, equipment, the medications are all paid for 100% under the hospice Medicare benefit. And that's really, I think, the biggest thing is understanding that the hospice benefit is really an insurance benefit. In my opinion, it's the best benefit that insurance provides for. As we can see, it's a holistic service that really looks at every aspect of care and ensures that care is able to come to you where you are. Again, it's reserved for people where time is growing shorter as defined by that six month prognosis and where the goal has shifted to focus on comfort care. So again, putting that into this context, we can see that when folks are faced with a serious illness, over time, things are likely to change as the options for life prolonging therapy or my ability to tolerate life prolonging therapy may be diminished. More of my care is going to focus on symptom management and quality of life. At some point, we'll reach this inflection where time is growing short and my goal will shift to focus entirely on my comfort and quality of life. And that's really where hospice shines, not only for ensuring that I have the best quality of life for each day that I have, but also providing bereavement services for my family after my death. What we'll often see is folks think about um, the role of palliative care as being kind of late in this trajectory. Often folks are thinking about teams like ours, a hospital-based palliative care team that will be involved in someone's care during a hospitalization, often as they're really approaching end of life or that transition to more comfort-focused care. And to be sure, there are a lot of needs that can be met at that point in time. There may be family meetings to be held to help make sure that everyone that's involved in care and decision-making is on the same page and understanding what's going on. We may be a bit of great help in identifying what the goals of care are. Are we nearing that point where the goal is shifting more to focus on comfort and quality of life, or are we even past that point? Have we had an opportunity to complete advanced directives, ensuring that if I'm not able to make decisions for myself, I've clearly stated who will make decisions on my behalf in my stead? Or have I documented what my wishes might be for varieties of different care and treatment if I may reach a point that I'm not able to get better or recover? There's opportunities to educate about important questions like code status, as well as to educate folks about hospice as we just spend a little time doing here. There's also a high likelihood that there's a lot of symptoms that might need specialty management for, things like nausea and vomiting, um, abdominal fluid that can build up in different illnesses, pain or delirium management. There may be opportunities to help with referrals to other outside resources um, that can help improve quality of life going forward, as well as help with discharge planning to make sure we have the right supports in place and psychosocial support, as often when we're faced 
with the later stages of a serious illness, there may be emotional, existential um, types of questions that arise that we can really benefit from additional support for. As well, when for folks making that transition to hospice, again, there may be other questions that we need to be supported, like do we need other equipment in the home for folks that are in the home, other teaching for cares if we're taking on more of that care, um, medications in those transitions, nursing support, bath aids, and so on, as we were discussing under that hospice benefit. And finally, support for our family in that period of bereavement after death has occurred. But I want us to think a little bit more broadly about this picture, this narrow focus on waiting for to engage with palliative care later in our course, I think creates a situation where we miss the opportunity to receive a lot of additional benefit. So I want us to dig a little bit deeper into palliative care. Another way we could define palliative care is as comprehensive interdisciplinary care, which is focused on quality of life for patients and their families facing serious illness. Now, if we break this apart, that first idea is that this care is comprehensive. It's inclusive of all aspects of care. Again, if we think about what this looks like in the hospital setting, when we're reviewing someone's case to get involved in their care, we're looking at the entirety of their record. We're making contact with all of their providers. Folks who are very ill in the hospital with a serious illness may be receiving support from a multitude of teams. They may have specialists looking at their lungs, another group of specialists looking at their heart, yet another looking at their kidney function, and another looking at infectious processes that are happening in their body. What we're trying to do is bring all of that content together to have a holistic view, not just to what's going on with each organ system, but how they all interplay with each other and what that means for my ultimate ability to recover and achieve that goal of getting back to the way I was before. It's interdisciplinary in nature. Again, we're, we have a multitude of professionals, each highly trained and skilled, focusing on different aspects of care, understanding that decision-making is not strictly just about medical information, although that's certainly crucial, but also looking at what are the other elements of my care, my psychosocial environment, my support network, my spiritual and existential well-being, um, and, and the other pieces that may need to be arranged for me going forward, especially looking at coming out of the hospital or returning back to the outpatient setting. Um, the focus is on quality of life. And this is really, I think, the critical element that what we're centered on are the individual values and needs of each patient. How we define quality of life is absolutely an individual question. And so really everything that we're doing is trying to tune into what are the needs of the individual in front of us? Do they have a good understanding of what's going on or could they benefit from more education to really have a clearer grasp of what their situation is and what they're likely to experience going forward so that they then have an opportunity to consider how that might be affecting their goals so that we can then advocate for the plan that suits their needs the best. But all of that centers on the needs of the individual person that's in front of us. That focus doesn't just stop with our patients though, but also extends to their families, taking into account the patient's support network as central to the well-being of that individual. And here I mean families in the broadest sense possible. We know that people think about family differently. Sometimes that's spouses and other blood relatives, but family may also engender our longtime partners, close friends, other people that are in our network, our pets. So really having a good idea about who the individual is that we're serving, how they define family, what's, who is in their sphere of influence, and how can we support those people as they're all banding together to help this individual face this serious illness. And that's that last piece, facing a serious illness, understanding that these services exist and can be involved at any time from diagnosis onward. That includes decision-making and care at end of life, but it's not exclusive to it. Really, any time from that point of diagnosis on. So that sounds nice, but what do we actually do? Well, you could think about this work as being centered primarily in two domains. The first is expert symptom management, understanding that when folks have a serious illness, that can come along with a lot of different struggles, common ones including pain, tiredness or fatigue, drowsiness or issues with sleep, nausea, loss of appetite, shortness of breath, depression or other mood issues, anxiety, and delirium or confusion that can set in in the context of illness. The other part of that work is really around communication and coordination of care. As we've mentioned earlier, understanding the nature of my situation is critical to being able to frame what my goals are. If I understand myself to be well and not to have any significant issues, my goals are gonna be pretty straightforward. 
Let's do whatever it takes to get me back the way I'm used to being and help me keep on going longer. If I understand that I may have an illness that's going to limit the length of my life or my ability to resume my prior level of function, my goals may begin to change. The other factor here being that once my goals are understood, making sure that that's well communicated to the rest of my care team so that they can coordinate my care effectively. So what does that mean? Often it starts with translating the medical record, making sure that folks understand really what's going on with their health care and their health issues. Identifying and addressing any questions that may remain or any gaps in their knowledge base. Identifying the values and translating that into the medical decision making process. So actually bringing the individual voice into that process of decision making. Establishing and clarifying the specific goals for care at any point in care and then coordinating among other care providers to make sure that everybody that's involved in your care is on the same page about what it is you're hoping to accomplish, as well as then assisting with transitions between care settings. And this is certainly true for palliative care in the outpatient setting, as well as in the inpatient setting or moving back and forth between those settings. So what I want us to do now is to consider what that would look like um, transposed over this figure that we've been considering and talking about. What would it look like to engage all of those elements of palliative care from that point of diagnosis onward? Well, even at the point of diagnosis, there are some important questions that come up. We mentioned before the advanced directives. So making sure that people have had an opportunity to be educated and to complete these forms to make sure that their voice is always heard. So when I say advanced directives, the most common ones we're talking about here are the durable power of attorney for healthcare and what's called an advanced directive or living will. These are forms that are good for anybody to fill out, but definitely for people who've been diagnosed with a serious illness, as we understand that things with their, our healthcare can change quickly. Anyone can be in a circumstance where they may be incapacitated and unable to make decisions for their own health care. It's crucial that your health care providers know who you want to speak on your behalf, who you've shared your thoughts and feelings about your health care with, if different circumstances would arise, and who you trust to follow through on your wishes. And that's what that durable power of attorney for health care accomplishes. The advanced directive is a really specific form that says if something would occur where I reached the point where my doctors felt I was not going to be able to recover or get better, I'm able to express what I would or would not want done medically to keep my body alive under such a circumstance. When I think about getting home every night, there's always the possibility I could get into a car accident that could render me both unable to express my wishes and unable to recover. And so it's a circumstance that is not always pleasant to think about, but one that could occur at any time. Ensuring that we've documented our wishes effectively is really a gift to our family members as well as to our healthcare providers to ensure that they know our wishes and are able to respect them as best they're able, even if a difficult circumstance would come up. Engaging people who are facing serious illness with this question early on is absolutely crucial to ensuring that their voice is heard no matter what might happen in the future. It's also critical that we're early introduced to this idea of goals of care understanding that the right thing to do at any point in time for my healthcare is not strictly speaking a medical question. It's a personal values question. It's a goals question. It's about understanding what is it that I'm hoping to accomplish. There is of course an important interplay between understanding what's going on with me medically and my personal values, but it's that personal values piece that really determines what the goals are. Being introduced to this idea early helps us more effectively navigate the healthcare system by being sure that we're always prioritizing those conversations and sharing with our healthcare providers what the focus of our care is, particularly as that is going to continue to change in time as things change with our functional status and with our illness. As time advances, my illness may present with more issues like symptom management needs, things like nausea, I may have other psychosocial needs as my circumstances change, as my needs increase and I require more support. There may be other referrals to additional specialists that I might benefit from seeing to help improve my functional level or my quality of life. Over time, my symptoms are likely to continue changing. They may become more difficult such that my primary providers or my other specialists may be struggling to really get me the best quality of life that I'm able to enjoy. 
And so again, having additional support from the palliative care team can ensure that I'm spending less time struggling with uncontrolled symptoms, which then restores more energy to me that I can spend doing the things I wanna do, like watching a football game, enjoying a bowl of ice cream, or spending time with family. As time progresses and my illness advances, we may then have more information about that question of prognostication. And that may be about time, as we discussed earlier, or it may also be about function in terms of how is my illness likely to affect me going forward? Am I going to be able to continue doing the things that I'm used to doing, or how might it slow me down or affect my function in different ways? Having that information can be scary for some folks, but we think about this as important as it affords us an opportunity to prioritize what's, what's most valuable and what we wanna do with our time and energy, which we think about as being our most valuable resources. No amount of money can buy me more time or more energy. Each day I rise with a certain amount and my life will be measured with that amount as well. If there's some knowledge out there about how time may be limited, it's good for me to have that available to me so that I can be sure I'm prioritizing what's most important with each day that I might have. In addition, we can see that symptoms are likely to continue changing. Again, having the support of specialist symptom management um, ensures, again, that I'm not squandering time and energy struggling with uncontrolled symptoms that might otherwise be better controlled. Again, as time advances, there may be other questions that arise. What have I done for my legacy building? What do I want to leave to the people who will be here when I'm gone? Have I addressed other important questions like financial questions or these other crucial questions of spiritual or existential import? Have I started to engage with these as time is advancing and things may be changing? Again, as we get closer and closer to that last chapter of life, there may be more need for family meetings, for engaging additional stakeholders, ensuring that my family understands what's going on with me. We want to have a lot of early opportunities to engage people in education about hospice, to be sure that when they reach that point that their goal has shifted to focus on comfort and where we know that time may be growing shorter, that they have an opportunity to receive that most robust benefit that can bring care to them. Again, with the goal of maximizing my quality of life no matter what things are looking like. We wanna be pretty sure that we provided timely education about this question of code status such that if people are having exacerbations of illness that land them in the hospital, they have a clear understanding about what these kinds of decisions might mean for them. And again, continuing to provide ongoing existential and spiritual support as people are approaching the end of life. In that very late stage of illness, again, there's a great need for excellent symptom management, hoping to maximize that quality of life and comfort no matter what's going on with illness. Again, making preparations for these transitions into hospice care and all of the support that that entails, as well as ensuring we've got appropriate bereavement support for our family after we die. And so what we can see here is that palliative care has an enormous opportunity to both support us throughout this journey of serious illness, whatever that might look like, to help maximize our quality of life and support our decision making to ensure that our voices are heard no matter what's going on with our illness. It's really a way to maximize the support of the medical system and make sure that everybody that's participating in our care is rowing in the same direction with us as well as ensuring that our family has been well supported throughout that process they're going through with us. And so what are the results that we hope for? What is it that we see for folks that are able to engage with palliative care in a timely fashion? Well, number one, we see the benefit of a team who has time to devote to intensive family meetings and patient and family counseling, who are skilled in communication about what to expect in the future and to ensure that that care is matched to the goals and priorities of each patient and their family who can provide expert management of complex physical and emotional symptoms and coordinate and communicate that care plan across all those providers and across all settings. Many studies have showed that palliative care significantly improves the quality of life for patients and lowers their symptom burden. And it also means that an encounter with the healthcare system becomes less stressful and much less traumatic for families. And so our hope is that by helping to encourage folks and helping to empower them to request and engage with palliative care, that we're able to really improve that experience throughout the healthcare system and primarily improve quality of life as much as we can for every day. So that's our overview of palliative care today. I hope that it's been enlightening. 
If you're interested in more information, there are wonderful resources from the Center to Advance Palliative Care. This website is a fantastic one. It's just getpalliativecare.org. It's got a ton of resources for patients and families facing serious illness, both to explore what kinds of palliative care supports are available to you in your area. And that's something that they're reviewing and revising all the time as we continue to try to expand the reach of palliative care throughout the community and across the country, as well as thinking about different ways that palliative care may be able to serve you or your loved ones. Um, a couple references here for our presentation today, um, but I'll be happy to take some questions. And again, wanna thank you all so much for your time and attention and for sharing this time with me. Thank you, Dr. Gamble. I, I learned a lot and it was definitely something that I needed to hear. So I appreciate you speaking about this tonight. You're so welcome. Now we are recording, but if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q and A. I did just mention that we are recording. We will be putting this on YouTube for you to share with others or watch again. So let's see. You know, Dr. Gamble, I think that um, helped me most in figuring out that you don't, there's definitely a care team out there that you can get well before your six month time limit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I can, I often um, will share with patients and families and my own personal experience that both of my grandmothers were enrolled in hospice for nearly two years. Mm -hmm. So really understanding that the way that that benefit is defined is kind of with this prognostic understanding, but knowing that that's not a perfect process, mm -hmm. that there's flexibility in that system. The goal here is really to try to meet the needs of our patients. Um, and so having a, a really overly rigid system certainly doesn't suit that need. Um, but really, I think that the crucial piece is understanding that there's this kind of broad category that's there, but that often it's available for a lot longer than many people think. And so really, the hope is that by helping with that education, people are able to be empowered to engage these parts of the system earlier and more effectively to support them no matter what time may look like or what their journey with their illness may look like. Agreed. So don't put it off until the last minute, right? There's support there before that. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, there have been some studies that show that in certain cases, people that engage with hospice earlier um, seem to live longer and certainly have significantly better qualities of life for the time that they have. And that's really, I think, the thing that we want to see more people able to take advantage of, to have the best supports of the system coming to them and supporting them no matter what time you look like. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Well, Dr. Gamble, again, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. If, um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I will try to get them answered for you. So I will bid you guys good night. Thank you, Dr. Gamble. You bet. Thank you so much. Bye.